Hey everybody, I've just seen a lot of cool videos of my teacher friends reading books to their uh, class, so I thought I'd pitch in. And uh, our book, of course, is College Physics. Let's uh, look at the Waves chapter here. Consider a marble that's free to roll inside a spherical bowl as shown in the figure. The marble has an equilibrium position at the bottom of the bowl, where it will rest, with no net force on it. If you push the marble away from equilibrium, the marble's weight leads to a net force directed back toward the equilibrium position. We call this a restoring force because it acts to restore equilibrium. The magnitude of this restoring force increases if the marble is moved farther away from the equilibrium position. If you pull the marble to the side and release it, it doesn't just roll back to the bottom of the bowl and stay put. It keeps on moving, rolling up and down each side of the bowl, repeatedly moving through its equilibrium position. We call such repeti repetitive motion an oscillation. This oscillation is a result of interplay between the restoring force and the marble's inertia, something we will see in all of the oscillations we consider. Yeah. Anyway, let's, uh, let's see here. Let's just skip a few pages. Skip to the end here. Sound. Yeah, standing waves. Beats. Uh, oh, here. In December 2004, a large earthquake off the coast of Indonesia produced a devastating water wave called a tsunami that caused a tremendous destruction thousands of miles away from the earthquake's epicenter. The tsunami was a dramatic illustration of the energy carried by waves. It was also a call to action. Many, many of the communities hardest hit by the tsunami were struck hours after the waves generated, long after the seismic waves from the earthquake that passed through the earth had been detected at distant recording stations. Long after the possibility of a tsunami was first discussed, with better detection and more accurate models, the affected communities could have received advanced warning. So, we're gonna, the study of physics may seem an abstract undertaking with few practical applications, but on this day, a better scientific understanding of these waves could have averted tragedy. Let's use our knowledge of waves to explore the properties of a tsunami. So a vigorous shake at one end of a rope causes a pulse to travel along it, carrying energy as it goes. The earthquake that produced the Indian Ocean tsunami of 2004 caused a sudden upward displacement of the sea floor that produced a corresponding rise in the surface of the ocean. This was the disturbance that produced the tsunami, very much like a quick shake on the end of a rope. The resulting wave propagated through the ocean, as we see in the figure. Trying to get the glare off there. There we go. The simulation of the tsunami looks much like a ripple that spread when you drop a pebble into a pond. But there's a big difference, the scale. The fact that you can see the individual waves on this diagram that spans 5,000 kilometers is quite revealing. To show up so clearly, the individual wave pulses must be very wide, up to hundreds of kilometers from front to back. A tsunami is actually a shallow water wave, even in the deep ocean, because of the depth of the ocean, because the depth of the ocean is much less than the width of the wave. Consequently, a tsunami travels differently than normal ocean waves. Wave speeds are fixed by the properties of the medium. That's true for normal ocean waves, but the great width of the wave causes a tsunami to feel the bottom. Its wave speed is determined by the depth of the ocean. The greater the depth, the greater the speed. In the deep ocean, a tsunami travels at hundreds of kilometers per hour, much faster than a typical ocean wave. Near shores, the ocean depth decreases, so does the speed of the wave. The height of the tsunami in the open ocean was about half a meter. Why should such a small wave, one that ships didn't even notice as it passed, be so fearsome? Again, it's the width of the wave that matters. Because the tsunami is the wave motion of a considerable mass of water, great energy is involved. As the front of the tsunami wave nears shore, its speed decreases, and the back of the wave moves faster than the front. Consequently, the width decreases. The water begins to pile up, and the wave dramatically increases in height. The Indian Ocean tsunami had a height up to 15 meters when it reached shore, with the width up to several kilometers. This tremendous mass of water was still moving at high speed, giving it a great deal of energy. A tsunami reaching the shore isn't like a typical wave that breaks and crashes. It's kilometers, it's, it is a kilometers wide wall of water that moves onto the shore and just keeps on coming. In many places, the water reached two kilometers inland. The impact of the Indian Ocean tsunami was devastating, but it was the first tsunami for which scientists were able to use satellites and ocean sensors to make a planet-wide measurement. An analysis of the data has helped us better understand the physics of these ocean waves. 
We won't be able to stop future tsunamis, but with a better knowledge of how they're formed and how they travel, we will be better able to warn people to get out of their way. All right, there's your physics reading for the night. Sleep tight.